You're listening to the Geek Saga Podcast. This episode features audio from a discussion panel that was recorded at DragonCon 2023. Welcome, everybody. I hope you are all here for Trust of the MLT. Wait, what? Who? <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what I was about to say. Make sure that you're here for that. Oh. Might be here for something else. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Question. How many people in this room have read the entirety of Trust of the MLT? Oh, no, wait a minute. Let me do the other way. Yeah. <laughs> How many people have not read the entirety of Trust of the MLT? Okay, so we've got five people who are probably going to be spoiled, I'm sorry. Yeah, spoilers will probably happen. How many people here are here because this is the only Cosmere panel and you really want to talk Cosmere lore the whole thing? (laughs) Okay, I love you and I have you, I I have a plan for y'all. So we're going to have a chat up here about trust. and all of the glories of that, and then some offshoots, I'm sure. If you have questions or comments, Cosmere Lore over here, Tress over here, and I'm going to alternate and make sure it's fair. <laughs> that works. All right, so getting started. Tress was a lot of fun to read. I really enjoyed it. It's definitely one of those, it's not worth the destination, but the friends we made along the way. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna mess up. I was just like that. So, my name is Christina Goodman. I have never moderated a panel before, as you can obviously tell. I am here with the track, the High Fantasy track, and I work as a, I'm a Sanderson beta reader, so I'm one of them. Um, and now we'll go down the line to. Hi. I'm John Hartness. I'm the founder and publisher of Falstaff Books. We're an independent press based out of North Carolina, and I am the author of multiple series, including Quincy Harker, Demon Hunter, Bubba the Monster Hunter, and The Black Knight Chronicles, among other things that I write. Uh, I'm Frank Morin. I'm an author of all types of fantasy. I get uh, epic fantasy and urban fantasy. Um, a young adult epic fantasy. Uh, Set in Stone is the one that's probably the closest to a Brandon-esque type book. But right now I'm, I'm really excited about Bacon Master of the Apocalypse, my humorous <laughs> fantasy with uh, culinary wizards and food magic. I'm very excited about So uh, that one is uh, super exciting, <laughs> which is why I'm talking about it so much today. My name is Tara Lynn. Uh, you can find me on the web at Geek Saga. I am the founder and organizer of Ice and Fire Con, which was the first ever Game of Thrones Song of Ice and Fire convention in the U.S. We ran for 10 years. We are on a one to two year hiatus because 10 years of running a convention almost entirely by yourself is exhausting. But I also have two podcasts. Uh, one is Sagas and Sass, which is a genre lit podcast. We cover one series at a time. We've obviously done some high fantasy stuff, but we're currently doing uh, Red Rising Saga. My main podcast, Geek Saga podcast, is extremely spotty, but I do have a series that will be picked back up very soon called 90s and Naughties Cringe Factor, where my co-host and I watch bad 90s teen movies and (laughs) talk about how they didn't age well. (laughs) We've done She's All That and Can't Hardly Wait so far, so. Those aged perfectly. (laughs) They're just bad when they launched. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kevin A. Davis, modern magical fantasy. A lot of it's set in the South, uh, Atlanta, Tallahassee. Um, I got the Angel Song um, series, which is Angels and Demons. I've got Kimmer Chronicles, which is um, a little Sakai mixed with a lot of cryptids. And um, I've got a new piece coming out, which is a paranormal procedural. I'm trying to do Warehouse the 13 meets Criminal Minds. And I do a little more horror in that one than ever, and I got to kill off a friend of mine, really gory, and she really loved it. So if you get a question, <laughs> Atlanta's Guide to Cryptids. So to start off with Tress, like I said, it's the, the friends we meet along the way. What other tropes did you notice and really enjoy that he pulled out, or didn't enjoy, if you'd like, that Brandon pulled out and, and used in this? Because it's full of them. One of my favorites was the unreliable narrator. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's a hard pro to do well, and I felt like he did a great job with it. And I'm going to spend a lot of this panel sounding like a big Sanderson fanboy because I'm I love the book. Yeah, it's probably the right room for that. <laughs> But yeah, I think to not step on everybody else's selection, I'll take that one. I okay. think the unreliable narrator was very well executed in mm -hmm. this. Yeah, that was a great one. Right. I agree. My mind's coming over to uh, Huck and the, uh, uh -huh. you know, the animal sidekick. Uh -huh. And uh, just how he played off on that and, uh, you know, set it up and did the twist. And just so much in there that played to the trope, but then also kind of put it on its head uh, in a lot of ways. Try not to give too many spoilers, but I'll probably give up on that in about yeah. 30 seconds. <laughs> so that's all I'm going to say about that right now. <laughs> I kind of liked the turned it on its head like that Tress wasn't just a Mary Sue. I guess in a way you could kind of say she is because in the end she turns out to be just so amazing, but it's by being kind of normal, right? Average. She's an she's supposed to be an average girl and she turns out by just being a kind person to drive her own story and the stories of like so many others. Fish out of water to be obvious, but it was so much fun to, to go through that innocent kind of, you know, I make pies and I'm, you know, and I help people and I do all these good, you know, positive things to I need to overthrow the sorceress. <laughs> that's, that's my plan. And no idea what's ahead of her. So we get to look at it and go, it's probably not a great plan. And then piece by piece, <laughs> nails them. I'm like, damn. So I love, you know, there's so many aspects that I love on this. We've been talking earlier, and it was cool because we were on a Tavirin panel. We're not talking about Tress. We're like, yes, Sanderson. But I had a ton of fun with that personality. I, I love a good open personality, one that is open for an event, new adventure and doesn't already know all the pieces or is too far reluctant of, I'm just not going to go there. I, I enjoyed this. Just like, I got to make a plan. It's going to be crazy and we're going to do it. And I'm like, yes. Please. Yeah, even though she kept apologizing all the way. Yes. You know? <laughs> I'm so sorry, but I'm going to be awesome here. Yeah, I'm gonna have to, <laughs> we're going to have to go into the Crimson Sea. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it was like she was Canadian. <laughs> Keeping that going with, with the concept of Tress as the hero, one of the tropes that I really appreciated was the kind of trickster almost, because she kind of builds into that, where she gets to the point where she realizes loopholes and things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she, oh, let me sit, you're trying to set me up, I'm gonna set you up. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like that was a really good twist on it as well. But let's talk about how we know that this was inspired by Princess Bride mm -hmm. and, and Sanderson's wife uh, saying, what a, why, why doesn't Buttercup do anything? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you want to talk about how, how sometimes outside stories can inspire writers and how this story feels like it's connected to other ones. One of the things I've always, if you listen to Sanderson um, discussing about story ideas, it'll be pulling in tropes or concepts from another one. Let's take a heist and add this to it. And then we're going to bring this piece and this piece. And you know, like, where do the ideas come from? And the concept was, write down an idea. It's just one tiny piece of an idea. A heist. I like heist. Let me put that down in my idea book. I like, you know, the bride becoming. I like the, you know, concept of the, the bell going to the ball. And all of a sudden you have Mistborn because you have pieces going together. So for me, it's one of the, you know, components I like about anything Sanderson is I'm not just going to get a flat edge. I'm going to get a, a crystal built by pieces and it's going to take me a little while before I loop around and all of a sudden I'm like, I love we talked just a second ago about how we went from, I like to make pies and, I'm, and, I'm, and I have all these fun little things in this tough little world to I am going to figure out the most impossible thing to happen which is to get off this island via a ship. And we're all like, where did that come from? <laughs> okay, but it came so naturally. It just was drawn right out of the actual personality. It didn't come off like, oh, suddenly this comes along, it just drew up there. And I was like, this is going to be a beautiful story. Right when I started to get to that point of, we have an impossible task, and I'm going to do it. This is how. I love it. Right, and every step of the way, I'm like, she's so dead. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I'm writing my books, I always get to the point where I'm just like, they're dead. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just going to start writing obituaries spot. here. They're, they're never going to pull this off. You know, and then... It's just really cool to see just several steps along the way. I'm just like, 
she is so unprepared for this. She's just so dead. Um, and But there's still a bunch of pages to go. It's like, this is going to be so fun. I really enjoyed the same thing where she was pitting herself against these forces she could never destroy. She could never beat it. And yet, just being herself, she figured it out. And that was, that was really cool. And it made it, it kept that, you know, intensity and that suspension without being like, okay, you know, she's going to dive off, you know, the tower and learn to fly or, you know, something <laughs> like a superhero movie. Yeah. She's just, you know, using her cups yeah. or she's, you know, doing something else really simple but profound and, and twisting that a little bit. And that was just endlessly entertaining for me. Going back to the original question of the Princess Bride giving Sanderson the idea for this novel, I just have to touch on, listen, we all love The Princess Bride. It's a classic, right? But his wife was not wrong. Uh, Buttercup doesn't do anything. She's kind of a useless <laughs> character. But the idea that um, a past work that everybody loves can give somebody an idea that produces um, a story where the main character, the female main character, is just like stumbling into things, but being so awesome and taking on that responsibility when she has to and just doing the dang job. I loved it. One of the things that I thought was a uh, parent influence were similar to Princess Bride, but also just YA lit in general. Because there's a ton of direct address, a ton of dear reader style in YA lit. And you don't see that as much in adult targeted books. And it was not my favorite thing at the beginning of the book. I was like, oh, great. If I wanted a bunch of Dear Reader shit, I'd read more Series of Unfortunate Events. <laughs> but as it progressed, he pulled it off. And well, he hit that tone with, yeah. with Hoy just yeah. so perfectly. So he managed to thread in enough breadcrumbs that I wanted to find out, okay, what's going on? This narrator is interesting. It's not just some omnipotent. And next, Dear Reader. Yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of a genre influence, and Brandon's written YA, so he's obviously well read in the genre. Yeah. And I thought he did a good job transitioning that to a piece that was designed for adult readers. You just gave me the perfect segue, thank you so much. I'm here my, for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my next question was, how do you think the choice of narrator affected the story? It's not the same book without it. It's a garbage book in first person if it's from the perspective of Tress. Yes. Because she's a normal woman who bakes pies and, ha and likes cups. And she lives on a shitty rock. Um, <laughs> it would have been too self-deprecating if she had been... Yeah. Yeah. And there's no story. It's either self-deprecating or self-aggrandizing. Mm. Because it's either, if it's in present tense, these are the things that I'm doing and I'm bored. Or, these are the things that I've done and I'm incredible. And it doesn't work. I think that using Hoyd as the narrator made the book. Yes, because the other option could have been a neutral narrator in third person, and that would not have worked. It just, like you said, it would That's 1995 high fantasy. Yeah. The humor, the humor wouldn't have been there. Yeah. You know, like, and that was such a when, when you're going for a, a very whimsical sort of fairy tale. Yeah, you got to have that humor, and the narrator really pulled it off. And you know, that was just what we were talking about the the Princess Bride being a huge inspiration for the story, and the fact that he could take that and then tie in that narrator, which ties into you know the broader Cosmere and Hoyd, which is so fascinating anyway, and give us the tone. And then he ropes in that other, the aether and the spores and, you know, something he's been per percolating on for Are a while. Nice Sorry, I won't talk about that. So, but yeah, just bringing in, the different, bringing in the different elements and then combining them, you get so much more than any of the individual parts. So missing any of those, the story would not have been nearly as effective. I've got to always be on the side of Hoyt. Have to. The fact that we're dealing with a Hoyt without any sense of taste. Okay? Um, that absolutely... He will. He, he so, you know, humiliates himself. Um, but the worst thing that could have happened is if, is if uh, we had a Doug for a narrator. Would you mind uh, showing off for a second? I, I gotta give kudos. Hi, Doug. So, yes, we needed this at Spark of Personality. Thank you, Doug. Um, we needed that spark of personality that comes from Hoy that really just sort of goes off the deep left end so many times that not only do you have a unreliable narrator, you have one that you're like, you're literally engaged in trying to 
and we know from the next one, there's a sense of wanting to engage into what is going on with the narrator. My own writing, that shouldn't happen. That shouldn't be what we do. That's breaking all the wrong walls. Mm -hmm. Can't do that. Stop. Okay? And it's wonderful. All right. So you mentioned Cosmere. How do you think this book fits in the greater Cosmere universe? I'm going to start with you because I know you've been excited to talk about this for okay. a while. I so want to know the seven-step journey. Okay, I want to know that story. Eraldi, they we got the wrong color hair, we're going in the wrong places. And it's like they just suddenly pop up and disappear. And it's not even in the timeline that I already know. And I want to know so much about it. I've got Awakeners, I've got Elantrians, I've got all these characters just flooding more than I'm used to on my Shadesmar. And all of a sudden I'm like, please, can we, you know, just get a few of these threads? I don't, and I know I won't. I know I got exactly what I'm going to get, and that's as far. So I'm having a blast with this one. And I, it's like I, I've, you know, done a reread on We, Me and Wife, you know, did our first read, and then I'm doing another read. Haven't even cracked the book yet because it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And we, we own a bookstore, so we actually have them you know, to sell. Um, but yeah, I'm having a blast with this. And it's like, there's so many pieces I want to go in so many places that I know that we're just feeding into some spots. The fact that we actually got to meet the dragon beyond an epigraph, beyond a letter. I was like, thank you. Can I have more of that one section, please? How, how many pages did you give me? Not enough. Uh -huh. so anyway, um, I love that we, we broke through so far on this one. Um, and I was grateful that uh, we did it on this one more than, uh, than any of them of the three that I've, I've heard. I wanted to ask, we were talking about Hoyt is an unreliable narrator, and of course, if you've read previous Cosmere books, of course Hoyt is an unreliable narrator. We've known that. How's the fact that we knew he was unreliable from the beginning changed the unreliability and the use of him as a narrator in this book that is connected but distant to what we already knew? I think part of the thing about Hoyt being an unreliable narrator is that we still want to trust him. <laughs> which makes him even better as an unreliable narrator because you want to believe everything he says is true and that he knows all of the things and that he, he has it all together and he has ducks in a row and plans within plans even more than, you know, someone else that we could talk about in here in Cosmere. Um, Cosmere. Um, so, so we want to believe him. So when he's not fully truthful, there is a sense of, oh, Okay, there's a little bit of a little bit of betrayal, but the but we still go back to trust it. And it's not his fault. Well, I mean, it is his fault. <laughs> he walked in and said, "Would you please, <laughs> would you please curse me?" But beyond that, you know, his narration is not his fault. It's he's as damaged and I'm unhappy with it as we are. But yet, it's fun to experience. Yeah, yeah. Didn't affect me at all. I'd never heard of Floyd before in this book. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a big Cosmere guy. I've read a couple. I've read the first Mistborn book, and I've read this. So welcome. That's okay. Yeah. Wow. We welcome. need to work an intervention here. And yeah. The, <laughs> I, backed, I backed the Kickstarter because I've met Brandon a few times. I like him. I thought it was a great idea, and I thought that if I backed the expensive hardcovers, I could probably resell them for money in a few years. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't realize that half a million other idiots were going to back the Kickstarter, <laughs> and, and it was going to be a bigger print run than most trade released hardcovers. <laughs> but I mean, I loved the book. I have enjoyed other things of his that I've read, but I'm not a Cosmere guy. So Hoy, I didn't know he was going to be a traditionally unreliable narrator. Had no clue. The cool thing is you can enjoy it still yes. without having yes. any background, and it still works yeah. perfectly well. I love the book. And if you read other stuff, it ties in perfectly with that. It still gives us more, but still makes mm -hmm. the story perfectly good. The way he walked that line was brilliant. It's almost better for... Farness, because I'm sitting there reading through, and I know you are too, everything we're reading, we're going, wait a second, who? What? Where are they from? What color hair do they have? You know, we're, like, we're trying to overanalyze, stop, just back up and enjoy. So me and my wife, we do, we tend to do um, Audible on those first reads for oh, yeah. these, because we're doing one on car trips, and it helps because it's too fast. Sure. I can't go back. If I have the book in front of me, I'll be like, wait a second, did that <laughs> chapter start? Like, And I'm like, stop. Okay, did you, did you want to... 
say something about Crosby or how you how much Sanderson you're I've read quite a bit um actually right, right before the panel we were talking about I haven't read New Era Miss Bourne I think that's the only that's thing right. I'm missing out and I, there's maybe one of it's his I know I know listen y'all it's been on my TBR list for like hours <laughs> um <laughs> And there, there might be one of his one-offs that I haven't read, but in terms of like Hoy being an unreliable narrator, like you were saying in this particular book, it's like, okay, yes, we already know that is a fact, but because of the curse, it's A, hilarious a lot of the time, yes. but B, it's like, it's almost like forgivable, maybe even a little bit too forgivable, like you were saying, because it's like, he's got this, he's got this, uh... <laughs> He's got this curse as his as his excuse, and and we can just excuse all the things, right? Can't we? Shouldn't we? No, I don't know. No. <laughs> I know. No, the answer is no. I was being sarcastic. I apologize for the simplicity of the question, but it is something that's on my mind. Um, I've read Miss Born Era One, I've read Stormlight Archives, and I've not read anything else except Warbreaker until Tress. And I wasn't interested in Cosmere stuff until I read Tress, but then Tress made me want to get deeper into it. Where, what, what should I read next if I want to delve into Cosmere? Alonso is his first published book, so it's a little bit rough. Yeah. And he has grown as an author and a person since then. Yeah. So I will put that caveat there. Thank you. But it does have a lot of, there, there are ties between Alonso um, and her soul is the novella that's on the same planet. And those two have ties to the sorceress. Awesome. So you'll see connections between magic on that. Yep. Yep. Would you guys want to Yeah, I agree. Arcanum Unbound. Yes. Yes. Arcanum Unbound. Arcanum Unbound is the mythology that has Ember Soul in it. Um, and it has a few other, like, smaller Cosmere stories. And it's one of my favorite Cosmere stories. And it's also one of the ones that I really like. Yeah. 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 Spoilers yeah. for Arcanum Unbound has a lot of spoilers if you haven't read. Right, Arcanum Unbound has a lot of spoilers for some of the other books, but they do have, it, it does have before each story some suggestion of what spoilers you might face. Um, but that's a good one to, to get into as well. And there's, there's some groups that they could join that would help feed them down the right path. Just be careful about spoilers. <laughs> yeah, watch spoilers. <laughs> yeah. Tell them. If the book's been out more than 10 years, you don't get to gripe about spoilers. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I agree. If it's in the Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, to the panelist who hasn't read Mistborn Era 2, he, and I cannot stress this enough, ha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so this one is... It's about Tress, uh, but particularly I am a Cosmere reader who spent a lot of his time very early on using audiobooks uh, because I do a lot of driving, a lot of uh, side work that could be done while listening to audiobooks. One of my preferred methods, but more recently now that I've caught up almost entirely, um, I got the Secret Project books and been loving them. They're fantastic and I love the artwork inside them. Uh, but I want to know, has anyone else been accidentally spoiled by simply opening the book and it happening to flip? <laughs> to one of the pages because they're bound separately? Not with this one, but with Yumi, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, this one I was greeted with a uh, very particularly red creature. Oh. Um, <laughs> and I was in chapter two. I was like, huh? So, just wanted to know if anyone else had experience. So you gotta read faster, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> gotta go quicker. Thank you. So, I liked how the story with Interest was pretty self-contained. And it's a coach of the Cosmere. Do we think we'll ever come back to this planet? Oh, yeah. I think, I think Brandon keeps all of the planets in his back pocket yeah. and will go there if he feels like he needs to. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I think one of the strongest emotional insights in the book happens from Boyd's perspective, and it's like whether or not you know, he's like mentally all there, um, he is how we, the reader, know that Tress like is extraordinary. At that mm -hmm. moment when she like. Uh, they trusted those extraordinary things. She yes. stopped and thought about oh, what she was doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's just whether or not, you know, who Boyd is or not, you get the sense that he at least has seen a lot of different heroes jump to conclusions. Mm -hmm. And just at least from like, an emotional standpoint, he's like, we can rely on him for that insight and trust. Which, because I was trying to think like, about what you were talking about, like, as how does he actually serve as a narrator to this book? Like, what is the book like without him? It's like, we wouldn't have that inside in your chest. Yep. Yep. Listen. Let's all be real. We should all stop and think about so many of maybe all of the things we do before we actually do them. So yeah, that, that was such a great line. And like you said, we wouldn't, not just that insight, that was probably one of the best ones, but not just that insight, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have that without Hoyd. Well, let's be real, specifically cursed Hoyd. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we let's know keep going. You're all you've been on the planet for, right? Mm -hmm. And Charlie gives this sort of throwaway line about how they all have blonde hair and like trust. Was that supposed to be a hint that Tress is actually descended from the Iriali somehow? And is that relevant? <laughs> No, I'm not. I'm, I mean, I have theories. But, yeah, that's all it is. Uh, does anyone else have theories? Because I don't want to take over. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, yes, that was part of the reason why I felt we were connected. But I don't have enough information. Like yeah. on Rashari, you start to really gather like a, a ton of information that you can build blocks with. Here you're left with like a line, a line. And you're like, OK, I could draw a lot with these two pieces of right. lines. Because what it does is it implies so, that the Iriali, But yes, thank you for catching. The Iriali come from an aether magic system and how does that affect the Iriali's connection to Roshar? Yeah. Which is where I went with it because I am that person. <laughs> and it's a great question. You know what Sanderson would tell us, right? <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> so just as like writers and uh, all that, one thing about the like Cosmere and Tress specifically that's always been really interesting to me is the world being bigger than everything that it's like this the characters not being able to know everything that just wanting to hear some of thoughts about that writing style for I feel like it's a very common trope in all of his books whether it's like Vin from Mistborn or Tress from this book of this like doing what you can do best in the moment is often better than the big plans upon plans because it's like we're always like hit with this Hoyt's the only one that can see everything kind of a thing that like nobody else really gets that. But I thought that was really, a really interesting concept as far as like writing goes of this like, I feel like we all love these like Moriarty and uh, Sherlock battles of wit plans and whatever, but that like so many of the main characters in the Sanderson books are just like doing their best yeah. I yeah. Think, as a byproduct of him building a world that like we literally have an entire 17th shard Wikipedia we're all trying to figure it out we have no idea but I don't know as far as like writing that when you're building a protagonist you have the option of building someone that you want your readers to want to be a superhero you want you if you're writing Superman that's hard, going to be hard for us to relate to because it's friggin' Superman. But we can relate to Clark Kent. So Sanderson's writing more Clark Kent's, and most of us can relate to people who are doing the best they can. It, it's a decision from the writer's standpoint of do you want people to read your book because they think your characters are cool and awesome, or... Do you want people to read your books because they think the story is cool and it makes them feel awesome? Yeah. And both of those are perfectly valid strategies for building a series. I have a really good time writing lovable idiots. That's what the tagline for the back on the back of one of my books is he's big, he's dumb, he's heavily armed. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a character, that's not my bio. Um, I'm only two of the three, and you get to figure out which two. <laughs> but as a writer, it's easy to write a protagonist that's everything you wish you were. It's more honest 
to write a character that is more fallible and more likely to do something stupid and luck their way into a solution. Or, holy shit, that worked. Needless to say, there's a level of financial success that's available <laughs> choosing the second plan. And it may sound a little mercenary, but a lot of us are writing books to make a living. Yeah. <laughs> so we want to do the things that are going to resonate with as many people as possible. That's my version, but not everybody builds characters the same way. No, that's a great point, and uh, it's a great question. Thinking about that, I was like, well, let me think of a character who's like super awesome and has it all together. Uh, I don't know if anyone's read like the Jack Reacher novels. <laughs> He's great because he is a guy that's going to come in and just beat the crap out of anybody who gets in his way, right? And we love that because, yeah, he's clever and smart and he can figure it out, but at the end of the day, he's going to take that big fist and shove it down someone's throat, and that's fun, right? People who read that, they read it for those reasons, right? And so you like a character who can destroy sometimes and be super awesome. Sometimes you want a story like that. When you're reading something like Tress or you know other characters, a lot of times we're writing the story from the character who's growing the most, because it can be difficult to write a story from the perspective of someone who's already figured it all out. They're boring, right? They're not growing, they're not figuring out their world, where someone like Tress in that journey, you know, it's kind of the classic YA journey, right? They're trying to become who they are and we go through that. And as they learn their world, we learn their world. There's a lot of reasons why it's great and we can really connect with them and feel ourselves as part of them. And it works very, very well. It's a very common way to do it for all of those reasons. You know, a lot of times those guys like, you know, Hoyt or somebody else who's got it all figured out, maybe, right? They're the mentor character, right? Who may or may not get killed off because they gotta let the new hero have space to, you know, become the hero or because whatever. that's that third step in the hero's journey. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a great question. And, and those are some of the things you gotta figure out when you're sitting down to write the book. And it affects the tone, it affects the arc of your story and, and what you can do with it. I think that there there was a period of time where particularly with fantasy slash high fantasy novels that the main characters were not supposed to be flawed, you know, <laughs> and that time has passed and what people are yelling for are relatable characters and I think that's why I mean that's why Tress particularly resonated with me it's why Stormlight Archive yeah. resonates with me and uh, I mean and, and a you know bunch of other series that I've read in the past you know few years but uh, yeah I think that that time of oh you need to be this like perfect hero of the ages has kind of and I, I use that <laughs> I know I just yeah. use that but that you know what awesome. I mean yeah. <laughs> This, yeah. Being this perfect hero of the ages, like people, maybe people probably didn't want that ever, but publishers really, maybe that's what they were just pushing, you know, back in the day. And that's why these books got published while maybe others sat on, you know, some, some author's shelf and, and their manuscript never got picked up. But I think that the more recently the call for these like really truly relatable characters has been really loud and it's why I love Tress and it's why I love most of Sanderson's works like literally for that exact reason but also just so many other things that I've read in the past few years that I don't remember having these sorts of fantasy novels when I was in like high school yeah they, they don't they don't start Therapy practices. Mm. High yes. Fantasy. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you have like they NK. Should. You have like, <laughs> you've, you've got Lee, yeah. Lee Bardugo, N.K. Jemison, mm. Robin Hobb, all of these great people that use the most flawed characters to start. Yeah. Okay, um, nothing better than N.K. and Jemison. You open that up, um, mm -hmm. City of the Became, and it oh, is just like so you, you've just got trashed people. and. We love that. We want that because, you know, they're part of how they're broken is how they succeed, which, again, gets into the Cosmere, but we won't go there. <laughs> yeah, and seeing them succeed despite their shortcomings is how we relate. Almost because of them. Yeah. In some cases, and that's, that's the beauty. Because then we're like, well, if they can succeed, I can succeed. I mean, it's that's that inspirational aspect of reading fantasy that yeah. we love. It helps us realize, yeah, you can accomplish a lot. Even if you just like cups, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And one of the other differences also in this is whether or not you're working on a series or whether you're working no. standalone. Standalones have a very specific fabric and arc you have to do. A series, you've got a lot more to work with, as we can see with Wheel of Time. You can run an arc that literally spirals down like a planet around a sun and you finally get to the end and it was no, at one point you're like, there's been three arcs mm -hmm. this person's or, gone through. And, or. yeah, four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
very related to that, like seeing flawed characters. Sanderson does a great job like bringing in inclusivity and diversity in his novels, uh, specifically in Tress, seeing the guy with the pad that he was typing on mm -hmm. and the letters flashing up on the other side. It was really interesting to see this sort of like high tech, very futuristic, almost sci-fi sort of aspect in a very typical fantasy with dragons and aethers and stuff like that. And as an ability aid. Right, exactly. It's, it's something that allows him to, to stand out and succeed like more than a neurotypical or fully abled person could, which is always great to see. Uh, but related to the technology, from an author's point of view, how tough is that to pull off, to have very high-tech equipment and stuff in a very low-tech world and universe? Um, that was a real cheat, because he, he went and bought that literally from some off-worlders who literally are off-worlders. They're not just world hoppers. They actually market via um, space flight. So it was like the biggest cheat you could possibly throw in there. <laughs> but you can get a has a laptop. And he calls it a laptop. Okay. You, you can get get away with it when you have a, the Cosmere, but I would not try throwing it into something you already haven't planned this for because you will just you'll tear us wide open. Well, well all of us will step back and go, "Wait a second. Right. Yeah, you gave me no hint that was coming in. You can get away with it here." Man, it's one of the only places maybe other than mm -hmm. Asimov's foundation where you show some really low-level technology and then say, oh, by the way, there's a huge galactic empire all around you. <laughs> Forgot to mention. <laughs> right, and you got to be careful with that if you're going to set up, like if you're writing kind of a traditional fantasy, which is often in a low-technology area, and you want to add newer types of technology, it's really fun, but you need to set it up care uh, more carefully. You know, that one was just kind of like, you know, yeah, you drop it in from off-world, and that's really cool. But if you don't have that option, there are ways to do it. Uh, in my Petrolist series, my young adult series, um, some of the magic that's kind of coming to life fuels like an industrial revolution, but using magic instead of, you know, steam-powered yeah. engines. Yeah. And so by the end of the series, their technology is dramatically different than the beginning of the series, but we've kind of walked it through every way as they've developed this stuff. Um, and then it works and it's really fun because then you can, you can start showing effects at a societal level, whereas a lot of times we don't do that. I really enjoy doing it. But I had to set it up over a period of books to get there or people would have just taken the book and thrown it across the room. They're like, what? Yeah, what? Totally. <laughs> you know, you get flying, you know. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do spoilers, sorry. Right, um, and Mistborn would not have worked with laptops, but the next Mistborn Impossible would be 80s tech. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. It depend, at the end of the day, it depends on how good you are. Yeah. yeah. And you won't know. You as a writer can't tell. Certainly not on book one. <laughs> he couldn't do this in Elantris. He yes. wasn't writer enough yet. I'm doing things I couldn't have done a decade ago. Every writer who's worth a crap progresses right. in their skill. And 2003 Brandon couldn't have pulled mm -hmm. that off. 2023 Brandon did a great job with it. Mm -hmm. So from a writer's perspective, yeah, you can do it. And readers and either editors or publishers or readers will tell you whether or not you're successful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they will. And they will not be shy yes. about it. Hello, I have a question about Huck. I would like to know when you kind of figured out who he was because I was confused because he's so noncommittal about the way he replies to things and he can't lie. We find out then and I'm like, oh, duh. But I was surprised, but then I felt like, hello, oh, well, that's right in your face. So I want to Which is as it should be. Right. As so, a writer's dream is yes. to be able to do that. So, so yeah. it was right at the beginning, because he chokes me, he says, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a huck. Oh, he's not Chuck. Because I immediately, oh no, I can't do the same guy. What, when did you figure that out? When he told me. <laughs> I was also, when, really? I, when I'm reading for pleasure, yep. I am working diligently to read for pleasure. Mm -hmm. When I'm reading as an editor, or when I'm reading and considering a manuscript, 
I'm thinking more deeply and I'm digging in. But if I'm reading for pleasure, I'm trying to be carried along on the story and I'm not working so hard. I read it as a surface enjoyable fantasy novel and I let myself be carried away and discovered it as the characters did. So that's me. I tend to get a little devious and I want to, I'm assuming everyone else in the world is. So for me, I will say my, when I got suspicious, but I had no idea why I was suspicious yet is the moment the lights went on when the cork got pulled out of the wall. The stop of like, wait, I didn't see you before. And I'm like, what did that matter? Why? Wait a second. What are you hiding from me? And I didn't know what was being hidden. It wasn't until we got much farther along, like, well, this would be really weird if, you know, like, and Sanderson's writing it. <laughs> okay? But if that, I can't even tell you when that happened, but I know that first moment when we, the light went on and there was that hesitation of like, I didn't see you, what did that matter? Why would that matter? It, you know, if you had a very, very, very bulbous growth off the top of your nose, I could see what they'd say. Well, I didn't see you in the light, because my God, that's horrifying. Um, instead, it was just your regular normal person, but I'm stuttered, stuttering at the fact that I'm finally seeing you. And I was like, wait, why? So I was suspicious then. I can't tell you when the moment came of like, oh, this would just be really cool if. I also try to not think too deep when I'm reading for pleasure because I have to do that, you know, for my other job. So I didn't pick it up until right near the very end, too. And uh, I enjoyed, the, you know, I like those flips and stuff. I honestly try not to see them coming just because I enjoy that feeling like, whoa, you got me. Hopefully my readers do the same thing, right? And they don't, you know, on page three, they're like, oh, I see what's happening. It's like, oh. <laughs> I love it when they're like, you carried me all the way through. I didn't know what was going to happen. It's like, yes, did it. One of my favorite moments was when another writer told me that about a third of the way through a book, he knew who the villain was at the end. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. Good for you. He walked off. I looked at the person sitting next to me in the room and said, I had no friggin' idea who the bad per who the bad guy was at that point in the book, so he's so full of shit, he squeaks. Because um, I had three or four, di I had four different options at that point, and I wasn't sure which road I was taking when I wrote oh, it. that's funny. So... <laughs> I feel so lonely because, like, I can't remember what point in the book it was, but as soon as Huck started kind of undermining Tress, mm -hmm. I got yeah. overly suspicious, and it was not long after that that I was like, oh, my God, this is her, like, I mean, I guess you can't call him her boyfriend, but this is, this yeah, is, yeah. this is, this is her love interest. And I, I wish, I wish I didn't have that thought put into my head. Uh, it wasn't super early in the book, but it was definitely way before. You're not gonna kill us, are you? He admitted it, so. Us? I mean, we, we already knew. Oh, yeah, we figured it out. <laughs> we figured it out pretty early on. There was this, actually this line where Boyd himself, in juxtaposition with uh, Huck, goes, um, sometimes the things you're looking for are with you the whole time. Yeah. And we were like, eh. Okay. That was probably the moment. Make sure you walk out crying because I feel bad. I was just like, wow, that was a really deep line. I love it. Yeah. 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 So. yeah. <laughs> Looking back, it's like, uh, what's the Bruce Willis movie? Sixth Thank you. Six Sense, yes. Yeah. Oh no, not the greatest Christmas movie of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back on it, it was a Sixth Sense moment. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, he pulled it off. Slight spoilers for Rhythm of War. Uh, we know that Odium's in game, you know, before the ending of the book, that we wanted to spread surge binding across the Cosmere. But really the more we're seeing with the side stories, we're seeing the magicisms from Elantris and Warbreaker uh, become more important. Uh, do you think that the further we get in the Cosmere, we're gonna see more Allomancy, Ferrochemy, surge binding be more important, or are we still gonna see, do you think we'll still see the magic of these little smaller one-offs, currently one-offs, um, be important and influential? Well, knowing what we know about Brandon and the way that he writes and the way that he, during the pandemic, wrote five books <laughs> that were not in the main series, he's not gonna again. He's gonna keep in his back pocket. He's not gonna let go of all of the all of the different magic systems. At, at this point, there's a few of them that we're still waiting to find out how they work. Mm -hmm. um, so he's got plenty of of play with that. So my theory is that Alamancy and Surge Biden being may be the more flashy and important diplomatically, but I think that all of the variety is still going to be there because all of all of the books, even within, I mean, Surge Binding has 10 different right. versions of it, and then Alamancy, Farrakhemi, and 
hemorrhagy are all three different, and they all have different subsets. Like, so the complexity is his default. <laughs> there will not be a simple overarching this takes over and it's all over that's my my, that's my theory so. so for for speculation purposes since we don't have a speculation panel this year <laughs> christina knows how much i love speculation um we have a relatively new magic system being introduced in trust um the azers were kind of introduced a little bit in giving glimpses of but um, what were your guys' thoughts on the Aethers and as a whole on the Cosmere, how they could affect it uh, going, I guess, back in time since this is a book kind of further along? So. I think it gives us, we're looking at something pre, pre or outside of uh, parallel to Shard, ad, ad nauseum. So it's like I'm sitting there looking at this going, how much are we going to use this to explain A, what happened shard 17th shard um why are we chasing Hoyt? so many different areas that we've been looking at it that don't seem to quite interface directly well, what's a city in cognitive realm where um silver line yes okay you know how does that how did that come come about how do the things are all these things attached maybe through a longer history pre ad nauseum where we actually have the aethers are the effect that causes this stuff. So yes, I think this is could be an explosive, you know, thing. These kids are going to have to learn to write, you know, to, to carry this down because it's just is going to end up being, you know, after we've jumped through these, finished these five, we take the break, we come back and do the next five. Are we going to start to see the connections there? Maybe the media, you know, the aethers, all these other aspects start to all come into components and, and connect. I'm definitely feeling like we have a lot that will happen with this, at least the possibility. So we should be as prepared as possible and study up and, and, and get all the notes in a row. I just hope we end up on one of those moons. I don't know, that's what keeps yeah. coming back to me. It's like, yeah. yep. what's gonna happen when we get up there? That's awesome. I we get pretty dehydrated, I'm just guessing. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna go back to the relatable characters. Um, so I work in the mental health field and reading Sanderson is the first time that I've seen mental health really well portrayed in fantasy, um, it's not just the hero that loses their mentor and two days later they're like, great, like I'm, I'm good to go. We see the cumulative effects of trauma. We see family trauma. Um, we see characters with PTSD, depression, DID, so many other things. And so I love that representation and how well he writes that. So I'm just kind of curious, how do you think we're gonna continue to see that trend of mental health and counseling in uh, fantasy slash what do you hope to continue to see so what do you think we're going to see what do you hope that we continue to see i'm not going to talk about what you will and won't see based on a literary background because like i said i'm not a big cosmere guy i've only read a couple okay. of the books but let's talk about being a human being and living in this world and one thing that you said much earlier is how brandon has grown as a person yes. and a writer as a good person at his core who cares about other human beings, I expect to see more depictions of that in his work because as we grow as writers and become more in touch with ourselves, become more in touch with the world and society around us, that impacts our work. Let's face it. We have communal PTSD mm -hmm. after surviving the greatest health crisis of the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. So if that doesn't show up in your work, then you are either actively avoiding that, and that's a choice that you as a writer can make, or you're an idiot mm -hmm. yeah. and go away. Yeah. Um, so I expect that it will continue to be a relevant part just because we're talking about a human being creating stories about and for human beings. It's that same level of relatable. I don't know most of the people sitting up here with me, but I'm going to guess that I'm not the only one up here who has a 30-plus year history of mental health issues. 
So, <laughs> I'm only looking at you because that's my eye line, okay. right? <laughs> so I'll judge you. I'll judge you later. Okay. <laughs> but that has to color our work as writers and creators. So, unless. Brandon decides to go live on a mountaintop and mail his manuscripts down to the unwashed masses right. and have no further contact with society, then I expect that will be something that continues to play a role because it affects our lives. And I, I think it's happening now. I'm watching even some of your writers. They are not afraid to turn around and say, I am represented in neurodivergence in my characters and my character is dealing with PTSD. My character is specifically dealing with it, but they're also being responsible. Whereas if it is an own voice, they are moving over to making sure that they have people that go through sensitivity yes. through these things, because yes. that's yes. so huge. I, I even see, I saw Sanderson do it the other day, and I just went crazy, and I was like, oh. Because I know people, friends of mine, that are having trouble when they read a word that is commonplace for us, but it still hurts for them. Mm -hmm. So I think we're already there. I really do. I, I think we're really moving forward. And it's not just indie writing, but we're also seeing in some of the, the, the five or publishing books that are more, even if they're just doing it for mercenary purpose. Oh, th this guy's got this behavior. We'll go ahead and, and, and cash in on this. You know, no matter what John says about making money, I know that's not what he's doing. He's saying, oh, look, I found a neurodiverse author. I'm going to go ahead and put them in place. But we do find, if you look past it, there's ways you can work through. If someone <coughs> is dyslexic, they need a different type of editor. Yeah. Okay? And you can get them that, and the story's there. Um, so I think we're already doing this. And I think um, for those on the cosmic, cosmic side, Kaladin is going to show us the way of the fifth book. And I love that arc, especially now that we got cool new digs. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, I really do think we're, we're making changes, and I think it's already here. Also, I think please, if you can find me a neurotypical author. <laughs> that's the difficulty is having that discussion because it almost you know the, the word diversion almost assumes there is a, a split and i really believe it's bandwidth i i agree oh yeah. we, we've got we've got a minute left so we got one more yeah, question we're quick. We'll, we'll wrap, we'll wrap sorry you tagged onto a thing that i really have a time for. oh i know <laughs> so you began talking with the narrator but i guess near the end i wanted to ask about the audience Mm -hmm. Who is Floyd talking to? Is it the same person that he's talking to in the movie? Floyd is talking to anyone who will listen. Oh, so Floyd's a, so a writer. Yes. <laughs> I'll take that answer. Yeah. Storytelling. Yeah. Story he could story. be talking to a lizard frog. <laughs> he does talk he does. to gremlins. Yeah. And, and plays his flute for them. Um, yes. Because he needs an audience of some sort, and they are around. <laughs> and they often appreciate them. Yeah. Which is important. <laughs> you can't perform it. Throw speculation, he's yeah. talking to his no, friend, so it's all lies. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you no to go. our panelists. Thank you for listening to the Geek Saga podcast. If you like what you heard, please check out other Geek Saga entertainment endeavors, including the Sagas and Sass webcast and podcast and Ice and Fire Con.